welcome to the R6RS training arc. R6RS report training arc, part eight, where we're on the right-hand side of page eight of the report, section 1.10, syntactic data and data values. This is my fifth video, I think, my fifth attempt to record this video. Uh, been having some trouble. I'm somewhat out of practice. It's been a month since I've made one of these videos. Also, I think this is kind of a tricky concept to explain. And, you know, there, there are a number of concepts you have to keep straight and a number of vocabulary you have to keep, uh, keep separate in your head. So I think I've got a way to explain things, which I believe is accurate. I'm going to try to go through again. I think I'm getting better, so hopefully this will be reaching a fixed point. A subset of the scheme objects is called datum values. These include booleans, number objects, characters, symbols, and strings, as well as lists and vectors whose elements are data. Okay, now already that's a little bit to wrap your head around. So we have scheme objects. So scheme objects are things like numbers and procedures and lists and vectors and records and all those sorts of things or, yeah. So uh, we have the set of all of those are the scheme objects. You know, you can imagine every possible version of every one of those would be the set of all possible scheme objects. And a subset of that set of scheme objects is what are called the datum values. Okay, so, so these scheme objects represent values. Remember in scheme procedures are values. And a subset of the set of scheme values sorry, scheme objects, those values are called datum values, okay? So it's a subset, it's a proper subset, it doesn't include everything, it doesn't include all the scheme objects. Datum values is a subset of all the scheme objects that you might imagine. These include, okay, these are the datum values, include Boolean values, well, there are only two of those, hash t and hash f, number objects, well, different types of numbers and scheme, characters, Okay, symbols and strings. All right, so all of those things are datum values, as well as lists and vectors whose elements are data. Okay, not all lists and vectors, lists and vectors whose elements are data. Now it doesn't say that this is an exhaustive list. Okay, it's just saying that these are included in this set of scheme objects, subset of scheme objects called datum values. Now, if you're familiar with scheme, you will notice something very fundamental to scheme that is missing in this list, procedures. Procedures are at the heart of scheme. And, you know, I mean, scheme is really an extended call by value lambda calculus, if you want to think of it that way. And so what is lambda create lambda create you know you evaluate a lambda expression you get a procedure well and, and procedures and scheme are higher order you know we use them all over the place they're not included in this list and you know so procedures are so fundamental to scheme that if you see a list like this and you don't see procedures that should tell you right away that procedures are not part of the subset of scheme objects. So datum values do not contain procedures. All right, very interesting. And if you look at the wording here, lists and vectors whose elements are data, well, clearly that means that lists whose elements are procedures are not considered data values and same with vectors. You could have a list of vectors of strings and that would be a datum value. You could have a vector of lists that contain some mixture of Booleans and number objects, and that would be a datum value. However, 
If you took either of those and you put a single procedure object anywhere in those lists or vectors, you would no longer have a datum value. Okay, so procedures are not included. Each datum value may be re represented in textual form as a syntactic datum, which can be written out and read back in without loss of information. Okay. So first of all, we've had two technical terms introduced. Datum values in italics. Remember, anything in italics is a technical term. Datum values has been introduced. Syntactic datum has in been introduced. So we have two new technical terms. Okay, this sentence has some really important ideas in it. First of all, it has the idea that the syntactic datum can be written out and read back in without loss of information. So that's a special type of value that we can write out to a file or send over the network, whatever. You can write it out and you can read it back in and you don't lose any information. Oh, very interesting. Because we know that the datum values are a subset of scheme objects, that means that there are scheme objects or values for which it isn't true, or I mean, presumably, that you could write those out and read them back in without loss of information. There are gonna be some scheme objects, presumably, that if you wrote them out and read them back in, you would lose information, or maybe you can't even do those operations. Maybe it doesn't make sense. You know, we haven't gotten far enough, but that seems to be the, the suggestion here. But in any case, you know, so far it hasn't explicitly said that. It's just said that for these datum values, for each datum value, it may be represented in textual form. Ooh, that's an important thing as a syntactic datum, which can be written out and read back in without loss of information. Okay, so some subset of scheme objects are the datum values. Each datum value may be represented in textual form as a syntactic datum. Okay, so the syntactic datum is a textual form of a datum value. Okay, that means that implies that sort of there's some sort of natural representation of a data value that might not be textual form, okay? But there, there is a, a representation, a textual representation called a syntactic datum for each datum value. And that's what can be written out, read back in without loss of information. All right. A datum value may be represented by several different syntactic data. Interesting. Okay, there's more than one syntactic data to represent a datum value. Moreover, each datum value can be trivially translated to a literal expression in a program by prepending a quote to a corresponding syntactic datum. Okay, there, there's quote and there's quasi quote in scheme or back quote. So, so this is the, the regular quote character, which is the, um, the key on a US keyboard that is to the right of the semicolon key and below the double quote, if you're using, you know, QWERTY. Okay. So you can trivially translate each datum value to a literal expression by prepending a quote to the corresponding syntactic datum. And here are some examples. So quote 23, which evaluate, you know, evaluates the 23, quote hash t, evaluates the hash t, quote foo, evaluates the foo, quote Left paren, one, two, three, right paren, evaluates to left paren, one, two, three, right paren. And then we have the vector representation, quote, hash, left paren, one, two, three, right paren. Gives us hash, left paren, one, two, three, right paren. The quote 
shown in the previous examples is not needed for representations of number objects or booleans. Okay, so those are what are called self self evaluating literals. And we'll go back through and, and try these things out in a REPL in a minute. I just want to get through this. Uh, the syntactic datum foo represents a symbol with name foo, and quote foo is a literal expression with that symbol as a value, as its value. Left paren 123 is a syntactic datum that represents a list with elements 1, 2, and 3, and quote left paren 123 right paren is a literal expression with this list as its value. Likewise, hash left paren 123 right paren is a syntactic datum that represents a vector with elements 1, 2, and 3, and quote hash left paren 123 right paren is the corresponding literal. All right, we'll go through this one more time and, and try everything out in the REPL. The syntactic data are a superset of the scheme forms. Thus, data can be used to represent scheme forms as data objects. In particular, symbols can be used to represent identifiers. Quote, left paren plus 2342 right paren evaluates to the list. Left paren plus 2342 right paren. Quote, define, and then a whole bunch of stuff evaluates to the list, beginning with the symbol define and having the rest of the stuff. This facilitates writing programs that operate on scheme source code, in particular interpreters and program transformers. Okay. Now, it took me a few times reading through this to feel like I had a good grasp on the vocabulary and the termino terminology and the concepts. I think I've got an okay grasp on it now. And so let's just go through it one more time. And as we go through these uh, concepts, we'll, we'll try some of them out in Emacs. And I even drew a figure for you, maybe to help out a little bit. Okay, a subset of the scheme objects is called datum values. These include booleans, number objects, characters, symbols, and strings, as well as lists and vectors whose elements are data. Each datum value may be represented in textual form as a syntactic datum, which can be written out and read back in without loss of information. Okay. All right. So we already... Um, you have a few concepts, like I pointed out before, and, and I pointed out that procedures were not included in this definition of datum values, okay? So let's just try an experiment in Shea scheme. So if I do like uh, lambda x, you know, plus xx, and I evaluate that expression, look at what I get. I get hash less than procedure greater than. That is a representation of a procedure. Procedures in Scheme are opaque objects. You can't look into their body. If I recall correctly, at least in some version of Python, you know, if you had a Lambda and it produced some sort of uh, procedure object, you could inspect that, or maybe that works in Ruby. I don't know. In some languages, you can look inside of procedures and kind of play around with them, get your hands on it, but not in, not in Scheme. Scheme procedures are opaque. Procedures also are not datum value. So a procedure is a value, but it's not a datum value. So notice, uh, you know, so so I don't have a way of getting a, a nice textual representation out here. And it certainly, you know, if I if I write a different procedure, and so maybe I make a times xx instead of plus xx, what do I get back? Hash procedure, right? I, I, I don't get any information about the body. I just get back this opaque representation. I could try putting a quote in front of this thing. Quote hash procedure exception. Okay, that didn't like that. You know, so the point is whatever we're getting back from a lambda expression, the procedure, we're getting back some non you know, uh, textual representation um, 
that, you know, we're not getting something back that represents the closure or the procedure itself or, or the computation in a usable way. We're just getting back, you know, some opaque object. We can't really do much with it. You know, we can ask, you know, if I say define P to be the value of, of the Lambda expression, okay. You know, I can ask questions like procedure question mark of P, sure. And I can create a list containing P and P and P and P. Okay, now I have a list containing those procedures, but there's not a whole lot more I can do with the procedure. I can pass a procedure into another procedure. I can return a procedure from a procedure and I can call a procedure. So I can call procedure, of course, with plus three, four, and I get back 49. But there's not a whole lot more to say about it. And I can't get my hands on what's inside of that procedure object. And there's no textual representation of the innards of that procedure object that, you know, nothing like that's exposed in Scheme. I think it's probably a good thing. It's a form of abstraction. So anyway, that's a, a design decision really deep, deeply baked in the Scheme. However, for these datum values, it's different. For datum values, we do get useful textual representations of those values. And that's what, you know, we, the syntactic datum. The so syntactic datum is the textual form of a datum value. So I can construct a list, for example. I can say list, how about list numbers, three, four, five. And I get back this left paren three, four, five. I can construct a list of symbols. How about cat, dog, rat? So list of quote cat, quote dog, quote rat. I get back the list, cat, dog, rat. Okay. I can also build that list up, build a, an equivalent list up by consing quote cat onto cons of quote dog onto cons of quote rat onto quote the empty list. And if I evaluate that expression, I also get back the list cat, dog, rat, all right? So you can see that I can construct this in different ways. There's also a literal representation of that list. So I can just do quote of what gets printed out as the, the, the list representation, quote of left friend cat, dog, rat, right paren, and sure enough, that evaluates the list, left for, uh, you know, lists containing three objects, cat, dog, rat. And of course, I can do things like ask the length of that list. Okay, now, Scheme is a Lisp, and Lisp stands for list processing. So it may not be a surprise that we can construct expressions whose values are lists, and we can get a textual representation of certain lists, at least that we can write out and we can read back in, we can manipulate in various ways. But I wanna you know, try to make the point that that's not a decision that would have to be absolutely made. So we've already seen that procedures are opaque and we don't have representations of procedures that are textual that we can write out and read back in without losing information. I mean, I could, you know, write out the uh, hash left paren procedure, I mean, uh, left bracket, right bracket or whatever. Um, but if I read that back in, that little string, it's not like that's going to give me uh, the procedure I want. Okay, so I, it, that's not the case with procedures that we get this nice textual representation and that's on purpose. So let's, Think for a second about how lists are represented in the computer. You know, what is a list object's representation? Here I've drawn what is often called a box and pointer um, diagram. And I'm showing two lists, L1 and L2, um, containing cat, bat, and rat, those symbols. Um, these are two distinct lists. And each list has three cons pairs. And you know, I'll type this at the REPL in a minute. I'll actually cons these up. And then I have um, lists L3 and L4 
which are the cutter of L1. Okay, so when we think about these variables, L1, L2, L3, L4, those variables can be thought of pointers to memory addresses. So if you think about how memory is laid out in a computer, there's random access memory or RAM, and part of that RAM is going to be what's called the heap, and that is generally where you're gonna get allocation of things like lists, okay? So normally lists would be heap allocated data structures, and they're heap allocated because they can keep growing. Um, and so anyway, we, we have these, every time you call cons, you're heap allocating a pair, you know, you're creating a pair in that heap, and uh, you get back a pointer to that pair. So L1 is really a pointer you know, it's just a pointer just being an address to a location and RAM and the heap, part of the RAM, um, to a pair. And what is a pair? Well, a pair, metaphorically, is just two pointers that happen to be joined together. So if you're on a machine with a 32-bit address space, there you, they could be seen as two 32-bit pointers connected to each other or on a, maybe a more modern 64-bit machine like I'm using right now, you have two 64-bit pointers um, you know, next to each other, that's a pair, and one pointer can point at one thing and one pointer can point at something else. It turns out that there are various optimizations, so if you wanted to represent a small integer, for example, you don't necessarily have to point to that you know, the, con, the car of the cons pair doesn't have to point to the number three. It can represent three directly within, um, within the car of the pair. There, there are tricks that people who write compilers and interpreters can use to be more efficient. So I'm not saying that literally this is how it has to be implemented in every system, but metaphorically, you can think of each pair as two pointers. And so... If we have L1 being the list cat, bat, rat, then that means L1 has three cons pairs. And you cons up these lists, you know, from the, the end of the list uh, up to the front. So the first pair you would have would be the pair whose car is the symbol rat and whose cutter is the empty list. Now, I could have drawn an arrow to some empty list object, but here I'm showing how uh, the empty list is often represented in box and pointer um, figures. I've, I've actually done it two ways that you'll, you'll often see. For the L1, you'll see that I've got uh, this, this 45 degree line, or 45 degree angle line going through that box, the, the cutter position, sort of like uh, if you've, if ever bold, it's like a, you got, what, a spare? Um, you know, I always think of that as bowling, like Big Lebowski. And then uh, down here for L2, you know, here we've got like a ground symbol from electrical, you know, circuits or whatever. So that's, uh, you know, that's like the nil, nil pointer uh, or just the empty list. Or we could have drawn a pointer to some object which represents the empty list. But in any case, so that last pair is a pair whose car points to the symbol rat and whose cutter is the empty list. And then we've cons onto that, a pair whose car is the symbol bat and whose cutter points to the cons pair that whose car is rat. And then we've cons one more time and we've gotten you know, a, a cons pair whose car is the symbol cat and whose cutter points to the pair whose car is the symbol bat and so forth. And L2 is similar. L2 is a separate list. We've cons it up separately, but we also had the car of the last uh, pair for L2 pointing to the symbol rat or being the symbol rat and similarly. So so the if you look at the printed representation of L1, it would look like left paren, cat, bat, rat, right paren. And the same with L2. Those, Printed representations will look identical, and we'll try it out in a REPL. For L3 and L4, 
those are pointing, they're both really pointing to the same thing, which is what the coder of L1 points to, which is a cons pair whose car is the symbol bat and whose coder points to a cons pair whose car is the symbol rat and whose coder is the empty list. L3 and L4 point, both point to that pair. Now, L1 and L2 are different lists in scheme in the sense that they are not pointer equivalent. So there is a notion of equivalence called EQ question mark, which is pointer equivalence. And L1 and L2 will not be pointer equivalence. If you do EQ question mark of L1, L2, you'll get back false. If you were to do equal question mark of L1, L2, you would get back a uh, true value because the, uh, L1 and L2, even though they are different lists in memory, the printed representation representations would be identical. Okay, L3 and L4 would also have identical representations, printed representations to each other, but because they also both point to the same area, I mean, to the same location in memory, the same cons pair, you know, really, you know, when you were drawing this, these uh, pointers, it's really, I guess, metaphorically pointing to the front of the cons pair. Um, but in any case, L3 and L4 are both pointing to the same cons pair. They're pointing to the same memory location and they would be EQ question mark. Um, so that's one way to think about how you would represent how a, how a list could be represented in memory. Now, of course, if we really got into the details, we'd have to get into details of, okay, exactly what does a cons pair look like if a cons pair, if a car or a cutter of a cons pair had a literal, like a Boolean or a small integer, would there actually be a pointer to that object? Or would that be somehow encoded directly within um, that 64-bit or 32-bit value? Often there are what are called tag bits that can be used to efficiently represent values. And all sorts of things like that. And of course, you know, there aren't literally arrows that we're drawing. These are memory addresses. And every time you ran a program, those numbers um, that the pointers represent pointing to an address in memory could change because you could be running the program in a different address uh, space. So, you know, the, these are abstractions, but this is closer in a way uh, to what's really going on than just looking at the printed representation. Okay, so you could see L1 and L2 could be different lists represented. Um, you know, the printed representation could be the same for L1 and L2, but the memory locations that they occupy in a computer could be completely different. Now, the symbols cat, bat, and rat are interesting because notice I drew the pointers to point to the same cat, the same bat, and the same rat because in scheme, you have these... what. I think what's often called interning of symbols. So cat, you know, when you write quote cat, then that gets stored in the scheme system. And this is how most implementations work. They, they do interning. And I don't know if that's officially part of the spec, if the spec uses this word interning, but that becomes a unique uh, value. So there is only one symbol cat. Uh, there, there, this is different you know, from cons, you know, if you cons up two, you know, if you call cons twice, you get two different pairs with different pointers, but there is only one symbol cat. There is only one symbol bat. There is only one, one symbol rat and so forth. Now, in some cases, like when it comes to generated symbols, you know, even the name of the general generated symbol um, may not be produced until uh, the, the program has to, you know, like the REPL, for example, has to print out that generated symbol. So there are some symbols where even the generation of the name, like in Shea Scheme, only happens at the very last moment. Now, that's implementation specific, but like I said, this is sort of a sketch of what might happen, a simplified sketch of what might happen in a real system. And the reason I wanted to bring this up, first of all, you should know it anyway if you're interested in scheme. Uh, but the, the other reason 
is that I think if we think about these lists and lists of symbols in particular, and we try these out at the REPL, then we can you know, think about these examples using this vocabulary of datum values and syntactic uh, datum and try to make more sense of it. And, and the, my first thing I'd like to draw attention to is if you look at this sort of figure, the fact that there is a nice uh, you know, textual representation of a list like L1 you know, maybe becomes a little more surprising because like, okay, well, there are actually these pointers and, you know, those are numbers or, or actually just bit sequences that can be interpreted as addresses and memory. And these are coming in pairs. And sometimes there's all sorts of fancy tagging tricks that are used. And, you know, all of that is being, you know, those complicated structures are being printed out as this very nice textual representation with left paren and whatever. Uh, so, you know, we, we take lists as granted per, perhaps, but, you know, the list structures can be very complicated, just like procedure representation could be complicated. Now, you know, procedures also have to deal with the environments, uh, you know, closing over the environments in a way that lists don't. But my point is that, you know, uh, going from the actual implementation in, in, in something like Shea Scheme of how a list is, is actually implemented in a running scheme system and then printing that out as text, that may not be a trivial, trivial thing to get all that working. Actually, after all the optimizations and everything, um, there's a lot going on there. So, you know, there's a, it's not maybe a surprise that that there are some values, some scheme objects that can't be printed out, you know, like procedures, but um, the fact that, that at least some lists, like lists of symbols, can be printed out with a nice syntactic representation, we should uh, thank the scheme implementers for that one because it's actually more complicated than you may think. So anyway, here's the example with these four lists, L1, L2, L3, L4, and we will play around with the, the REPL and try to make some, some analogies here. So... Let's just define these lists. Define L1 to be cons of cat, cons, let's see what I do. I did cat, cat, bat, rat. Cons of bat, cons of rat to quote empty list. All right. So that is L1. And I will define L2 to be the value of the same expression, but even though it's the same expression, it is not the same list in terms of memory where the cons were constructed. So if I ask what's the value of L1, I get left paren, cat, bat, right, right paren, nice. If I ask for L2, same thing. If I ask equal question mark, which is um, you know, looking effectively looking at the printed representation of those two, the, then yes, um, those are the same, whether we get back hash T. However, if I ask EQ question mark, the pointer equality, I get back hash F because they are not literally the same structures in memory. L1 is pointing to a different address in L2. We don't have direct manipulation of pointers in scheme in terms of pointer arithmetic and printing out addresses and all that. So I can't show you that those are different, but the EQ question mark returning different values tells you that they must be different. As far as a symbol like rat goes, equal question mark, quote rat, quote rat. Yes, of course. What about EQ question mark? Yes, they are the same. Okay. Let's uh, build our other two lists so we can define L3. All right, so let's look back at our L1. L1 was cons of uh, quote cat, cons of quote bat, cons of quote rat. It's the empty list, so we got the list cat, bat, rat. For L3, we are going to take the cutter of L1. That gives us the list bat, rat. 
And for L4, we will also take the coder of L1. And L4 is the list bat rat. And I can ask equal question mark L3, L4, hash T, EQ question mark L3, L4, hash T, because L3 and L4 are pointing to the same location. Like I said, I don't know, maybe I should have drawn this arrow for L4 pointing to, you know, kind of the front of the cons pair. It's, uh, you know, by convention, I think people aren't too worried about it. If I'm pointing to a cons pair as opposed to a car or a cutter, um, that's usually how people write these things. So, you know, apologize, apologize for being a little sloppy, but that's kind of, you know, a shorthand. Okay. So, um, okay, so datum values, these lists, L1, L2, L3, and L4, lists pointed to, you know, the lists who, uh, you know, if you evaluate L1, uh, the variable L1, if you do a variable reference, you get back the list, cat, bat, rat, okay, that list of three symbols is a datum value, list L2, cat, bat, rat, a different list, um, but with the same printed representation, that's also a datum value. Lists L3 and L4, which are both the identical list, bat, rat, like identical as in the same memory addresses, um, those are also datum values. Now, if we had any of these pointers pointing to a procedure object in memory, then that those lists, you know, whatever list contained the procedure value wouldn't be a datum value. All right. Each datum value may be represented in textual form as a syntactic datum, which can be written out and read back in without loss of information. All right, so this uh, can be represented in textual form as a syntactic datum. So this structure that L1 is pointing to in memory, if we think of the actual pointers in memory for each of these cons pairs, and the tagging schemes and all that, you know, that that is in some sense the the scheme object, and you could think of that as the datum value as I as I'm reading this, if I read this correctly. However, you know what what we're going to see at the REPL, that printed representation, that textual representation, you know, things like. Um, left paren, cat, bat, rat, right paren, that would not be the datum value itself, but that would be the syntactic datum, which is a representation in textual form of the datum value, okay? A datum value may be represented by several different syntactic data, okay? So if we think about our datum value, say uh, L1, of the list, um, you know, cat, bat, rat. So what is, what is the uh, syntactic value for, okay, syntactic datum. The syntactic datum for that datum value, well, so if, if I say that a, a syntactic um, datum would be left friend, cat, bat, rat, okay, that's fine. Um, and of course I can put a quote to make that a literal. Okay, and that gives me back the list cat, bat, rat. Uh, however, you know, actually, at least in terms of, of constructing these sorts of structures, there's more than one way I can write um, things syntactically because it turns out the list cat, bat, rat, no, oh. excuse me. And you know these dotted pair representations: cat dot, you know, left friend cat dot, left friend bat dot, left friend rat dot, empty list. You know, right, 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 uh, or right, right, right. Uh, that is equivalent to the list: left friend cat bat rat right friend. Because in some sense, there's no such thing as a list. There are only pairs, and pairs with certain structure an inductively defined definition, those are what are actually lists or what we call proper lists. So every time you see a list, a proper list without dots in it, 
unless it's the empty list, you know that that thing is made of, of pairs and the, the printer for the REPL suppresses those pairs normally. Okay, but uh, you can see that you know, for, the, for the same textual representation of a list, I have multiple ways I could construct that. And here it's saying a datum value may be represented by several different syntactic data. Um, moreover, each datum value can be trivially translated to a literal expression in a program by prepending a quote to a corresponding syntactic datum. And then we have a bunch of examples and then it says you don't need that for numbers. So 23, you could write qu quote 23, that evaluates to 23, 23 evaluates 23. It's a self-evaluating literal quote, quote 23, values the quote 23 though. Okay, so you can only add one quote. And this is the same with uh, Boolean literals. So quote hash f values to hash f, so does hash f. This isn't true with symbols. So if I type in foo, if I don't have a quote, well, that's, then foo is treated as a variable reference. Okay, so it's like, hey, foo is an identifier. You know, it's a variable in this case, so, so look up its value. I have to put a quote foo. All right. Now, one more thing. Um, we can write out each datum value may be represented in textual form as syntactic datum, which you can written out and read back in. So in Scheme, we have the ability to display information and write information. So I can do things like display, uh, you know, how about cat? I can display the string cat, and then you see C-A-T right there. Um, I can also notice that the double quotes went away, by the way, you know, okay. I can also, and, and also I can display uh, quote cat. Looks the same, okay? So, so both for both the um, string and the symbol, I get back C-A-T. However, if I use write instead of display, if I say write quote cat, that, that gives me back cat. If I say write double quote cat, the string, I get back the string cat. Okay. And I can do things like, oh, what's a good one? Mm. You know, I can, I can write structures, uh, you know, I can write uh, complicated list structures, foo, you know, left brand bar, that, five hash f and then you know do a, a vector of three four five all that and then what i get back you know what was sorry what gets written out is you know this textual representation that could be read back in using something called read so i can call read and i can also give read an input port that a you know uh, got from opening a file or things like that. But here I could, uh, okay, so let's read in, let's say, read in, let's read in the thing that I just wrote out. And when I put that in, I get back that same structure. So, you know, I could, maybe, maybe it's a little easier to see if I say define, you know, V, to be whatever I read. Okay, and what's the value of E? There we go, that structure. Okay, so with write and read, and with write I can write things out, I can write things out you know, over the network, I can write things to a file, for example, and then I can read things in. So it's pretty typical in Scheme to maybe write out some structure that you want to read in later when you rerun a program or run a different program. Or maybe you write an object and send it over the wire and some other program, maybe on another computer, can, can then do a read and then process that. So a read basically can do build-in parsing 
Okay, so you get these these nice uh, S expression parsing uh, built in for free. So you know, instead of writing a parser, if you're writing, say, a scheme compiler, the first thing you do is just call read, and then you're done. That's the end of the parsing. That's nice. At least that's one approach. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there anything else I want to say about that? Okay, so, so let's just talk about this real quick. The syntactic data are a superset of the scheme forms, thus data can be used to represent scheme forms as data objects. In particular, symbols can be used to represent identifiers. All right, so let's just try this. Quote plus 2342. Okay. And of course, if we quote that, we get back the list plus 2342. If we wrote left paren plus 2342 without the quote, that's, that expression is just immediately evaluated, perform addition on 23 and 42 to get back 65. But if we quote the expression, we just get back the list. And similarly with uh, define. So let's see if I, eh, copying that might be tricky. I'll just type it in. Define fx plus x 43, uh, 42. Okay, define, what is MIT syntax, define. Was it fx plus x42? Okay, so if we just defined it that way, f would be a function that adds 42 to the argument you pass in. But of course, we can just quote that entire expression and we get back a list. And this allows us to do all sorts of um, you know, program transformations and interpreters and all those sorts of things. So, you know, if I, uh, well, let's go back to maybe the first one, you know, plus 2342, if I wanted to, you know, change the operation to a multiplication, I can do little things like this. Okay, so I cons quote um, star onto the cutter of quote left paren plus 2342, and I got back left paren star 2342. And of course, because we have eval, I can eval what we get and then, you know, evaluate that expression, or I could write my own interpreter that would handle that expression and get back 966. Uh, so the, that's a very nice feature of Scheme is that just by adding quote to a form, you know, now you have a data structure you can manipulate. And this is what, at least part of what people mean when they say uh, Lisp has code data isomorphism. We can go back and forth between these representations. Now, of course, there are other ways we can manipulate programs in Scheme. We can do things like macros as well, but this is a, a powerful way to uh, do metaprogramming. There are many, many ways to do metaprogramming in Scheme, programs that have uh, manipulate other programs. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Now, wow, that took a long time because, like I said, this is maybe the fifth time I've tried to record this, and we're up to 48 minutes already. Um, I, th I just think that's a little tricky, trying to keep track of data values versus syntactic datum versus literal expressions and you know keeping all of that straight and the fact that we don't have procedures well let's just try one more thing okay so so let me try writing out let's see what happens so i want to write out a list containing three four five okay no problem i want to write a list containing vector uh, three, four, I don't know, six, five. Okay. All right, no problem. Now, what happens if I try to put in lambda x, x? Okay. Uh, see, sure enough, we went from having a good time to having this hash, uh, you know, angle brackets procedure thing. 
So let's just try some reads here. So I'll define R1 to be read. And let's just grab what we have the list of the vector. Let's just grab what we got back there. I'm gonna paste that in. And let's look at R1. Okay, we get back exactly what we typed in. Let's try doing the same thing to find R2 to be a read. And now we're gonna paste in what we got out with that procedure and see what happens. Ex well, invalid sharp sign prefix hash. You know, left, you know, basically it didn't work, okay? Just choked on it completely. So we can't write out a representation of a procedure and then read it back in. In fact, you can't you just can't can't even read in that um, representation of the opaque object as a procedure, or you get an error. So procedures are not datum values. They are scheme objects and they are values, but they are not datum values, and therefore they do not have a, a syntactic datum. They do not have a textual representation of their contents where you can write them out and read them back in without losing information. That's not the case for scheme procedures. Now they don't say that here explicitly, but you can sort of read between the lines because they left out procedure, okay? Now could a scheme implementation implement such a feature? That's an interesting question. Would that be compliant with the spec? I don't know. We have to see later in the spec when it you know, talks about this more explicitly, like, well, you know, are you allowed to leak it from the implementation standpoint? What sort of information about a procedure are you allowed to leak? Now, if you do leak some information about a procedure, certainly any code that took advantage of that wouldn't be portable across scheme implementations. Um, but I, I am curious, you know, to what extent the scheme spec specifies that implementations aren't allowed to leak information about a procedure. You know, to what extent do scheme uh, procedures have to be opaque? I don't know. Like, could could you have a, um, a printout of a procedure that told you, you know, what the internals look like? I don't know. You know, is that, if, I mean, if, obviously you could, but would that, you know, be in uh, violation of any part of the report? I don't know that it would be. It'd be interesting. Are there scheme implementations that show you the guts of a procedure? That seems like a, you know, not really in the spirit of scheme, but it could be hel helpful for debugging, I guess. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Well, that's it for now. You know, you could see that we're up to continuations, but we've already done way, way more than, uh, than I, uh, well, I wouldn't say, say way more, but we're at a good stopping point. Okay. I'm not going to tackle continuations, even though it's a short section. So we will continue on next time, I hope, uh, sometime soon and get on to continuations. All right. So we're at the bottom of page eight now. And we'll get over to page nine for continuations next time. Hope you're doing well and hope to talk to you soon. Bye-bye.